So welcome to Playing with Unicorns, episode eight. This week, we're going to be discussing the business of venture capital. So this week we could dis discuss exactly how venture capital works because most entrepreneurs come in and basically see VCs or venture capitalists as a pool of money, uh, people that are going to give you money to go and build your startup. But I think it's actually rather useful to understand exactly how these venture capitalists operate. What is their business model? How do they make? How do they get money? How did they make money? And what approach they have? Because it'll make you smarter when you go and, and, and start a fundraise. And so to, to join us today to explain the business of venture capital, we're going to have uh, FJ Labs' very own um, Jeff Weinstein, who's also known as uh, Venture Boy. He's like the, the, the nerd of uh, venture capital in the organization. And so, Jeff, why don't you give a little bit of your background and then uh, get going? Sure. Thank you, Fabrice. So as, as Fabrice mentioned, I, I love to geek out about venture capital. Um, my background, I have been at FJ for coming on four years now. Uh, prior to FJ, I was at Lux Capital, which is a New York and Valley-based venture, venture firm, where I was working a lot on LP fundraising, investor relations, and operations. And so I got to see what it's like uh, on the business side of a venture capital firm. I come from a finance background. I worked at a hedge fund for a couple of years before that. I studied politics, philosophy, and economics undergrad. And so always been really interested in business and investing. And now at FJ, I co-head the investment team. And then I also manage our LP fundraising uh, efforts as well. Perfect. Thanks for the intro. So why did you get going? Cool. So... As Fabrice mentioned, a lot of playing with unicorns has been focused on entrepreneurship and from the entrepreneur's angle, I thought it'd be interesting to give you guys a look behind the curtain at how venture capital works and the business of venture capital. So what is venture capital? VC, venture capital, is a subset of private equity. Private equity is investing in private companies to buy a piece of ownership in these companies uh, with the purpose of investing and, and trying to make a return on your capital. Venture capital uniquely is focused typically on the early stages, and unlike a lot of private equity where you're actually buying cons controlling stakes in companies, with venture, you're typically investing in early stage minority positions, high risk, high reward, high growth. So typically, that profile fits that of a technology company. So although it's not exclusively technology, uh, venture overwhelmingly focuses on early stage tech companies. And it's an extremely important part of the U.S. Uh, business ecosystem. Most of the well-known tech companies in the U.S. have received venture funding. It's pretty rare to see a bootstrapped uh, large-cap tech company. So you'll see the same number of names, I'll mention them later, come up that in funding the, the engines of the U.S. innovation economy. So it's pretty interesting. U.S. venture capital actually came a lot of people believe from the whaling industry. There's a really interesting book I recommend called VC in American History, which delves into detail here. The reason for this is that uh, similarly to investing in high-risk startups, whaling was a high-risk yet high-reward endeavor. So what uh, these trading companies would do is that they would seed whaling ships. These whaling ships would go out for three years at a time uh, many of them would come back empty handed, but a couple of them more than paid for the rest. And so uh, if you think about the return profile of that, it's, it's a power law distribution, which means that a very, very small number of companies, or in this case, whaling ships, uh, earn the vast majority of the returns. So the logical way to invest in uh, an asset class like that is to diversify. So what people would do is they would build portfolios of these ships they would invest across 10 or 20 or more ships, making sure that they, they land those winners and those winners pay for all of the other losers and then some. And so the way that the captains of these ships were compensated is they get to take home a percentage of the profits that they earn. A lot of people believe, and we'll talk about this later, the way that VCs are compensated, uh, this is how the, the term carried interest came to be. So very interesting. This also talks about how not only... It, is the 
the structure similar, the way that these uh, these these firms were built is similar, and the return profiles are similar as well, which is pretty amazing. So on the top left, you can see the way a VC firm is structured. You have investors, limited partners. They put their money with a VC firm that's run by general partners. They will run individual funds, and each of those funds will invest in entrepreneurs who have their own companies. And sure enough, wealthy individuals would invest with whaling agents who would then have individual voyages, and each voyage would be crewed. And it's a very similar structure. And if you look on the right, uh, you can see that the return profile is similar as well. So a lot of the asset class as a whole, a lot of the whaling industry did badly, but a couple of firms – and a couple of whaling, uh, a couple of whaling firms did extremely well, and you can see that the venture capital return landscape eerily mirrors that of the whaling industry. So the modern VC structure, we talked about this before. VCs are managed by general partners. They typically put in two percent of the fund as their own capital. They put their own capital as risk, and the way they earn money is they take 2% of the fund per year. By the way, this is a closed-ended fund. So you as an investor will give a manager your money. You will invest it for 10 years. You typically will fund it in tranches every four to six months. You'll end up funding your entire commitment in the first three years, typically, three to five years of the fund. That's called the investment period. And that manager will put that money to work in investments and after investing all of your capital in the next in the first three to five years of the fund, they will put it to work. They will they will then in the second half of the fund work on harvesting it and returning your capital. So the venture manager will take two percent of the overall fund each year as a management fee. The purpose of this is to staff out the team, to oversee companies, pay for travel, pay for all sorts of expenses that come with running a venture firm. And then they get compensated based on how the fund performs. So carried interest is a percentage of the profits. So if you have – let's just use round numbers. If you have a $10 million fund, about 2% per year of that, so 20% of the fund total goes to management fees. So that $10 million turns into $8 million of investable capital. Let's say you double that $8 million, your investments on average – Earn two x on what they on on you know on investment, that becomes sixteen million dollars. That sixteen million dollars, you end up earning six million dollars in profit on your ten million dollar fund. Out of that six million, twenty percent of that six million dollar profit goes to the manager. So one point two million dollars goes in carried interest to a, a VC. Sounds great, right? Not quite, because venture is an extremely illiquid asset class. So you're not typically, as a venture manager, seeing carried interest until you pay back 100% of the principal. That can take seven, 10 years, sometimes more. So a typical VC doesn't actually earn any carried interest until year eight, year nine, year 10 of a fund. And a lot of VCs don't earn carry at all. So it sounds very glamorous. It sounds like an amazing business model and it is really interesting and it's really fun but uh it's not quite the 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 golden outcome that people think it is because carry takes a long time the average startup can take five to seven years to exit so the out the typical fund isn't returning a hundred percent of the principal until typically seven years so the typical fund is a 10-year lockup so if you invest in 2020 you don't, don't expect to see uh, your initial capital back until 2030. <laughs> so it's a very, very, very long-term asset class. And in fact, a lot of funds actually have to extend because all their companies haven't sold. And so uh, the other nice thing about being a venture manager is that carried interest, that profit I talked about, is not taxed as ordinary income. It's called it's taxed as long-term capital gains. So it, it it, the purpose of that is to encourage investment, and I do think it does so, but obviously that's very controversial now because most people don't get to pay, get paid capital gains uh, for their job. So, In terms of the actual history of venture capital, we talked about the roots of it. The first VC fund, you could call it that, was started after World War II. It was uh, the American Research and Development Corporation, also known as ARD. 
Uh, and it was funded. It was it was used to spur small business innovation in the U.S. George Dorio, who's thought of as the godfather of American venture capital, was the former dean of Harvard Business School, uh, and he raised this this fund with the purpose of spurring business development. It was not really a for profit venture, uh, and and the early days of venture capital in the U.S. Uh, were dominated by the American oligarchy, you could call it, the, the, the families that dominated the Gilded Age uh, and their successors. So the, the, the early families uh, of venture capital, many of whom, by the way, are still active in the asset class, uh, Warburgs, the Mellons, the Rockefellers. In fact, the, the venture capital fund Ven Rock literally is Venture Rockefeller. It was started by John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s son, Lawrence, and it continues to this day. Bessemer Venture Partners, which is one of the most famous and prestigious funds in the U.S., was actually a family office for the Phipps family, which, who is Andrew Carnegie's business partner. Since the since early days, these are no longer purely family offices. Bessemer and Ven, Ven Rock now have college endowments and other institutions as investors. But it's just really interesting to see how this asset class started as the domain of the, the mega rich in the U.S. And it's since it's since opened up a bit and it's expanded. So. What does it look like behind the scenes of a venture fund? Uh, it's a very autonomous organization, typically, where you have a fund, and then you have what I would describe as a loose affiliation of individual partners. They often have different expertises, different focuses, sometimes different sectors and geographies that they invest in, each with their own personality. So when you're taking money from a venture fund, it's important not to think of them as a monolith. They truly are an affiliation of individuals and you're and you're picking your partner and that partner typically will sit on the board of your company uh, and they will bring their unique expertise to the table. So a couple of examples I have here, Andreessen Horowitz, also known as A16Z, they have partners that run the gamut in terms of expertise. So they have marketplace experts, they have fintech experts, they have, bio, they have a biotech fund. So they have an entire fund dedicated to biotech. They have enterprise software experts. So when you're raising a company, you're not just raising from a fund, you're raising from a person. And that person is your champion internally, and that person is your representative. So it's very important to think about that when you're raising venture money. It, a lot of people look for the prestige of the fund name, but you should really think about the individual partner there because it can make a world of difference. The way a typical team is structured, I touched on this on the, on the whaling slide. Uh, you have the, the partners at the top, they will put their own money into the fund. Uh, they have the most skin in the game, and they also are compensated accordingly. Uh, they typically – then you have the principal level. The principal will sometimes run deals themselves, take board seats. Uh, they're typically partners in training, and they will start to get carried interest, a piece of the profits. And then below that, you have a, a, the senior associate or associate role. Uh, this – can go one of two ways. It can be either a, an apprenticeship where you're basically being groomed to be on a partner track. A lot of firms, though, also uh, because venture is such a, a small asset class and these firms typically don't uh, expand over time, uh, this is often a little bit of a revolving door where they, they sometimes will have predefined two-year programs. You might work as an analyst at Union Square Ventures, for example, who's famous for this. They have a two-year uh, analyst program. You get to learn. You get to meet companies. It's a, it's a pretty amazing opportunity, but the expectation is after those two years, perhaps you go to business school, you go operate a startup, maybe you start your own fund, or you work for one of the portfolio companies uh, at Union Square. But it's it's uh, it's it's typically the case that uh, it's, it's like a, almost a rotational program. I shouldn't say rotational program, but there, there's a, there is like a, a defined end time to that program. So it's important. This is for people who are thinking about investment team roles. Uh, there's, there's a, make sure you understand if this is a potentially partner track or not, because there's nothing wrong with it not being partner track, but it's just important to understand that uh, you use that time to gain experience and expect that you're not going to be with a firm for the long haul. So Sand Hill, this is a picture of an office on Sand Hill Road. Sand Hill Road is the, the Wall Street of Silicon Valley. It's literally just a road. It's actually not all that amazing looking. Uh, it just runs from Palo Alto you know, through the South Bay uh, um, in, in uh, California. But it's become 
the most expensive commercial real estate in the U.S. because all of the venture funds want to be in this iconic address, the same way that finance firms in New York might want to be on Wall Street. Sand Hill Road has literally turned into its own phrase. And so there are over 50 VC firms on this road, including a lot of big name ones that you would know, Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, Kleiner Perkins, the list goes on and on. There's been a recent trend uh, where funds have followed entrepreneurs into San Francisco. And so there's been a little bit of a dynamic where these funds are opening offices in San Francisco to be closer to the founders uh, and, and try to have a competitive advantage when sourcing deals and winning deals. Uh, and so it's just an interesting dynamic that we're seeing. But at the end of the day, the headquarters of, of almost all of these prestigious venture funds are all in this one strip in Silicon Valley. So Fabrice has covered this before, so I won't dwell on this too long, but there are different uh, stages of each startup and each stage that at which you raise has a different uh, profile of investor. So for, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to be focusing largely on seed to series B and beyond. I'm not going to be talking much about the friends and family. There are some angel pre-seed funds uh, like Afor, Amplify, and Fika. They fall into the bucket of which I'm describing. This, this talk is really going to be about institutional venture capital where funds raise money from investors to deploy on their behalf. And you can see here that at each stage, there's a different expectation of traction, uh, of round size and evaluation. But again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So I just touched on stage. I, it's funny. Uh, there are different funds that specialize at different stages. This is, it's interesting. This has been changing a bit where people are trying to specialize to differentiate. Uh, but in reality, the typical institutional fund is becoming more and more multi-stage. So you have a couple specialists. So if you look on the left side of the slide, you'll see pre-seed funds. To be honest, the difference between a pre-seed fund and a seed fund is it's not it's not that strong. A lot of seed funds will write the first check as well. To me, it's a little bit of a branding difference. Uh, but then you have the uh, Series A and B funds, and those funds are very focused on writing six to ten million dollar checks to get ownership in companies. Uh, and then you have funds that have grown and they're actually multi-stage. They're trying to be a one-stop shop to fund a founder all the way from seed until IPO. And now actually uh, with a phenomenon we can talk about some other time and past IPO as well. Uh, so it's important to understand as a founder where the uh, fund that you're talking to lies in this ecosystem. If you're raising a seed round, don't even bother to talk to some of these late stage firms like IVP uh, or TCV. So everyone knows SoftBank, of course. But, but uh, however, if, uh, you can talk about, uh, if you're raising a seed, you can talk to funds like Sequoia or Lightspeed. There's become an increasing phenomenon where if you're raising a seed fund, you want to focus on raising from seed managers because there may be some signaling risk. If you're looking to raise a seed round and you take money from Sequoia Capital, for example, uh, you're likely going to raise more capital and your next round will be a Series A. But if Sequoia Capital chooses not to invest in your Series A, everyone knows that they have ample money to fund you through your life cycle. And they're going to wonder why Sequoia, who's known as one of the best, if not the best funds in the world, they have ball control here. They see what's going on at the company better than anyone else. Why are they not investing in this round? So it's something to think about as an entrepreneur. This is a uniquely... Uh, this, this problem is typically unique to the early stage. At the later stages, things become a little bit more, I could say, like commodified. Uh, but the lines are blurring as, as funds get bigger and they start to invest across the life cycle. Other funds try to differentiate themselves by specializing in certain sectors. So I used to work at Lux Capital, which focuses a lot on frontier tech and science and technology investments. But there are funds for every specialty. There are SaaS funds which focus on software as a service, biotech funds, fintech funds. FJ Labs, we focus on marketplaces. So uh, we focus on a business model versus a, an industry per se. Consumer funds, ed tech funds. Uh, so also important, if you're, pitching, if you're pitching a marketplace, don't talk to Lux Capital. Don't talk to Arch. Make sure you're talking to someone who, who fits the bill of, of the type of company that you're trying to build. And also funds specialized by geography. 
So we are actually global investors. We'll invest in virtually all of these regions, and we have relationships with most, if not all, of the firms on this list. But we're a bit unique. Um, typically, the 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 thinking has been, if you are a VC and you want to be active and value add to your portfolio company, and you plan on sitting on the board of this company, it's important to be nearby. You want to go to the board meetings in person. You want to be able to drop by the office. You want to be meeting with founders. Uh, And so historically, funds in the Bay Area have overwhelmingly invested in the Bay Area. Now, COVID is starting to change things because obviously nothing is in person anymore. Uh, Founders are typically living on Zoom. VCs are living on Zoom as well. So we're starting to see a bit of a change. It's unclear if this is going to be permanent or if it's just a moment in time. But a lot of VCs are actually starting to expand outside their geographies. So Andreessen Horowitz has invested in Latin America. Uh, Sequoia is investing in Europe. Sequoia also is unique. They have regional specific funds. But we are seeing traditional, uh, what I would describe as like geo specialists starting to branch out a bit, which I think is quite interesting. Now, another thing to consider is that you can learn a lot about uh, a fund based on how large uh, the pool of capital that they're investing is. Uh, The typical VC wants to lead something like it could be one to three deals per partner per year the round that you're investing in dictates the amount that you can invest so a typical seed round right now let's call it three million dollars uh that means you can only put max three million realistically more like one and a half to two million of dollars of capital into that fund into that round rather so what i'm trying to say is if you know a fund is three partners. Each of those partners is going to lead three deals per year. Uh, That means that that fund can do nine deals per year. And they're investing over three years. That's 27 deals. 27 deals focused at seed that dramatically caps the, the amount of money you can raise as a fund. So fund sizes often not only dictate, but are also dictated by, uh, by focus. So a seed fund, that's why you see a typical seed fund will range between 50 and $150 million because you just can't put that much more money to work at that stage. So uh, it's really interesting to see how as fund sizes get bigger, strategies inevitably have to change because seed rounds are not getting bigger. So you have to, if you're going to invest more money, you have to do it at later stages where you can put more money to work. This is related to portfolio construction. So I touched on this a bit. Uh, Now, the reason that partners typically do two to three deals per year, it's not just because of, um, well, a lot of it's because of bandwidth, because if you're leading a deal and you want to be active and you're sitting on boards, it's a lot of work to invest in a company. But it's also important to understand how VCs think about returning funds. A typical seed-focused fund typically invests in about 30 companies. And they care a lot about ownership, meaning when they invest in a fund or they invest in a company, they want to own 12 to 15 percent of that company in that seed round. And by the way, valuation also then comes from this, because if you're investing one and a half million dollars in a three million dollar round and you need 12 to 15 percent ownership, that dictates the valuation at which you can invest. So it's interesting to see how all these things are related. Valuation, ownership, money you can put to work. It's, it's very interesting. So why? Why do people care so much about ownership? Well, if you invest at seed, you're going to get diluted a ton on the way up because every new round of funding dilutes you a little bit more. So if you own 15% at the seed round, you might get diluted 20% at the Series A and then another 20% at the Series B and then another 15% at the Series C. And it goes on and on. So even if you own 15% at seed, by the time a company exits, if it IPOs, you're going to probably own less than 5% of that company. Now, a billion dollar exit and you own 5% is $50 million. Your fund is $50 million. The, the, I would call it the KPI that, that seed fund managers are laser focused on is returning the fund. Because what they're concerned about is if you own 0.01% of a billion-dollar company, uh, you're only going to return $1 million, 
And it's not that often that you get to invest in a billion dollar company. So you really want to make your wins count. That's the whole concept of the billion dollar company, the unicorn. It's rare. So what you're betting on is that it's, you're going to get into one of these and you're going to make it count because returning the fund is extremely important. And, and why do you care so much? Well, I just talked about it. Uh, it's really, really hard to get in those quote unquote unicorns. They're, even if they seem extremely common now, uh, this is a distribution of the typical venture round outcome. So it's so what this is saying, this is saying that 51% of the dollars that went into a venture round over 10 years lost money. And then another 31% only returned one to three times your capital. So what this means is that almost two thirds of VC rounds lost money. So if you're going to, so VC is, and I'll talk about this in a second, but VC is all about hitting home runs. So you better make it count if you do get into one of these good rounds. You better have enough ownership that you can, that you can return your fund. Interesting fact here is that a lot of investors in VC funds want to make sure they have time diversification because where you are in the macro cycle matters a lot. You can see here what this says is that if you invested in 1999, you're, you're, the, median, the mean outcome is a 14x multiple, and 25% of the rounds that took place uh, earned more than 10 times their capital. Look at if you were investing in 2001, though. In 2001, it was near impossible to earn that type of uh, return, and the vast majority of funds uh, lost money in those years. So it's important not only to be diversified across managers, but also by vintages as well, because when you're investing in the cycle, it's extremely important. Now, I touched on this a little bit, but the way that venture firms are being raised is shifting. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that companies are staying private longer. They're getting bigger faster. Uh, and they're, and, and the, the overall size that they can become is exploding. So a famous company in China, Pinduoduo, it's a group buying app for groceries and for now they've expanded to electronics and other items. This company was founded five years ago. It's now a publicly traded $100 billion company. So these are numbers that were unfathomable a couple of years ago. Uh, forget about a decade or two ago. So what you have now is you have the opportunity to invest later stage and still make incredible returns. So what venture funds are doing, knowing that this opportunity exists, is they're, they're bulking up. Uh, they're investing at Series A, and then they're continuing to plow money in through later and later rounds. A good example of this is Sequoia Capital has a growth fund, which is a later stage fund. They invested $100 million into Zoom, the video conferencing app, uh, at a billion-dollar valuation. <laughs> Zoom is now a $140 billion valuation. So you can still earn monstrous returns at later stages now. Uh, which is not something that was necessarily the case before. So funds are bulking up to deploy more and more capital. There are over 40 funds now that are a billion dollars in size. And so uh, it's a pretty interesting trend that we're seeing, which means that there is more and more capital, especially at the mid and late stages, which is fighting over similar deals. Now, interestingly, Shai Goldman, who works at Silicon Valley Bank, and he... Uh, he has a lot of data around fund performance. He points out that the larger you get, and this is kind of intuitive, the larger you get, the harder it is to return your fund. So he basically showed that if a fund, DPI here, by the way, means distributed, distributions to paid in capital. So in order to return a five times fund, if you imagine you raise a billion dollar fund and you want to 5X that billion dollar fund, you have to return five billion billion dollars in capital. You have to get $5 billion in exit proceeds. If you think about the size of the typical exit, uh, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to have monstrous, monstrous exits like Sequoia did with Zoom, by the way. Sequoia did this. Sequoia, I think Sequoia's Zoom investment alone 8 x their billion dollar fund. So don't get me wrong. It is possible. It's just hard. You need mo monster, monster exits. Uh, otherwise, it makes sense to raise a smaller fund where the outcomes don't have to be quite as enormous. Uh, and you can still return really, really uh, impressive multiples. This is just a fun page that I put together out of intellectual curiosity. I wanted to know who the best performing venture funds of all time were. Uh, some of these are estimates 
based on what I could pull from articles. Some of them are facts that you can see from uh, public foundations or endowments that were investors. Sutter Hill Ventures is a really quiet, secretive fund. They've become a little bit more well-known because they just uh, incubated and took public Snowflake Computing, which is one of the hottest tech IPOs uh, in the past decade. Sutter Hill Ventures is an evergreen fund, so that means they don't actually raise funds every couple of years like everyone else on this list does. They just have a pool of capital that uh, they have eight investors, and they basically just continue to deploy it over time. And the money that they return just goes back in, and they call capital when they need it. It's a pretty interesting structure. Now, no one's really heard of them, and they don't even have a website. They have like just a landing page as their website. Uh, but I found some information, and over a 35-year period, from 1970 to 2005, they achieved a 36% annualized return. I, the, that number is like one of the best investing track records of any asset class. Forget about venture. And that's after they were charging 36% carried interest. So the typical fund we touched on it before charges 20% carry. Sutter Hill charges 36% carry, and that's a net IRR after that. And that was before Snowflake Computing, which is one of the greatest exits in venture history. So I don't even know what their IRR is now. It, it must be just unbelievable. I think they're probably the best consistently performing uh, fund or venture firm of all time. Some other ones on here which are insane, lowercase capital. This was only an $8 million fund, so although it's incredible – uh, the numbers here, like in terms of a cash returned perspective, are not quite as crazy as some of the other ones. But they, I mean, Chris Saka, his, he was an angel investor in his track record. He, I mean, right place, right time. But also, this was just amazing. Benchmark, their very first fund was an $80 million fund. Uh, and they they had eBay, which was one of the great venture outcomes of all time. So they, they it, I've seen 60x, I've seen 90x. I'm not sure what the actual number is, but just insane. So... Uh, it is possible to achieve just unbelievable outcomes. And like, if you have a, a fund like this, I mean, y you are like venture royalty. So you'll see a couple like benchmark is on here twice, which is why they're one of the greats. Uh, emergence, they are, they are still to this day own 10% of zoom. Zoom is trading as well, I haven't checked a couple of days, but like $140 billion valuation. So there's still have $14 billion of value in just zoom. Their fund was $275 million, so just amazing stuff. Talking about returns, what does like, good returns look like? What do normal returns look like? Well, Shai here has some more data on, on typical venture funds. Uh, and here's the breakdown. You can see that it's really hard to get these outcomes. So like I just showed you the best of all time. I think it's fair to say that a good venture fund will return after all fees, uh, two to three times your capital. And of course, your IRR, which is your rate of return, it depends on how long it takes to get that money back. But if you're an investor in a venture fund and you're getting two to three times your money back, uh, you're happy. Like That's good, and you would do that all day. In fact, uh, if you look on the bottom here, Shai says, if you hit a 3x DPI fund, you can raise three more funds after that. So 3x, like a 3x fund is great. You can raise more capital all day long if you get a 3x fund. Uh, but as we see here, Venture as an asset class overall, like if you were to just index every venture fund, you're not having a very good time. So it's really important to get into the top quartile managers because one of the unique things about venture, unlike if you invest in, say, mutual funds or, you know, or public equities or, or other asset classes, it's actually a sticky asset class. So the best performing managers get the best deals and they, their returns stay the best. So Sequoia is Sequoia, it's like, it's it's funny, they're Sequoia because they're Sequoia. So now the best entrepreneurs in the world want to work with Sequoia Capital. They will often accept term sheets from Sequoia at lower valuations, substantially lower valuations than other funds. So Sequoia has, not only do they uh, see all the best deals, they win all the best deals. So it's a pretty unique asset class in that sense, in that like who you're investing in really matters. So every investor in venture funds wants to get in that top quartile of funds. And the cool thing is it's actually it's actually pretty easy to figure out who those funds are. You can look at the branding, the names, but you can also just look at their returns. So if you have a good returning fund, you're more likely to have another good returning fund. And this is not the case in other asset classes, which makes venture pretty special. Now, 
to talk about FJ, I've, I've told you guys about traditional venture funds. We're actually very different. In some ways, we're like an anti-venture fund. Uh, the way we invest is we are angels. So an angel investor means we don't lead deals. We're not setting the terms. We're not buying up ownership. We're not taking board seats. Uh, and we're deciding very quickly. And the, our model is predicated on investing alongside these traditional lead investors. So for Brees and Jose are successful serial entrepreneurs. They were both backed by some of the best VCs in the world and have close relationships with them. So we find ourselves writing small checks alongside them and working in tandem with these, these venture goats, as I'll call them. So our portfolio is not 30 companies. Our portfolio is going to be, in our most recent fund, is going to be 500 companies. Uh, we don't care about ownership. We have a tendency to invest at the early stage, but we will invest at later stage as well. We have a heavy focus on marketplaces, which is helpful because we, we've, across the FJ team, we've built a ton of them. Fabrice and Jose are some of the most expert marketplace builders and investors in the world. And so we have a reputation for being one of the preeminent marketplace investors in the world. So we see the best marketplace deals when funds like Bessemer or uh, DN Capital or General Catalyst, when they see an interesting online marketplace, they think of us. And because we're only investing a small percentage of the round, it's no problem for us to come in alongside of them. And we move really quickly. Our decision process is typically two phone calls. So that helps us get into these competitive deals. So our like the pitch for FJ is we're seeing all the best marketplaces in the world. We're getting into them because we have relationships with these funds and we're small and we move quickly so we can win in those competitive deals. And the other thing that's unique about us is that we're global. So we have investments, I think, in 20 plus countries and we have relationships with the top VCs in each of those markets. And so we get into the best global deals. We're not just fighting at crazy valuations over the same couple of Bay Area deals. So it's a pretty cool strategy. It's, I think it's pretty defensible because we have a lot of interesting barriers to entry. Fabrice and Jose's uh, track record as entrepreneurs, our relationships with these funds, uh, their reputations in a lot of these markets. So it's, it's, I think it's a winning strategy. Now, talking about the profiles of investors in these funds, it's typically not individuals. You have to be really, really wealthy as an individual to be investing in venture funds. Uh, the typical fund will start off small because it's hard to raise money early on because you don't have a track record. So you end up just, it's actually, it's actually, it's kind of similar to raising venture capital for a company. You start off with friends and family. You're typically starting off with, with high, net high net worth individuals. And each round, each successive fund, you typically scale and you move up the food chain. So your first, comp your first fund might be something like 10 to $20 million, and you might be taking 100K checks, a million dollar checks from high net worths who are betting on you because they have that relationship with you. Uh, and then as you get bigger, you start moving up and you start taking bigger checks from more and more institutional investors. You might move up to family offices. So now we're talking either a single family office of a billionaire or multifamily offices that invest capital from a bunch of different families. And then you move up to a fund of funds, which they raise money of their own, and then they deploy it into a diversified portfolio of the best funds. And then corporates who might be interested in sharing strategy with you, and uh, they might be interested in trying to buy your companies or invest in your companies and foundations and pension plans. And, and you basically move up this LP food chain and everyone has different interests. They have different sales cycles, you could say, and they have different things they care about. And so uh, it's, it's, it's something to think about if you're like an aspiring manager, who are you targeting and at what point in the life cycle of your firm? I just talked about this, so I'll, I'll move ahead. Uh, we're seeing a lot of innovation in venture capital at the moment. There have been interesting platforms like AngelList, which basically lets anyone become a VC. They take care of all the admin headache, all the compliance, all the regulatory, all the reporting. So if you have a friend who's raising a cool company or you have access to some very cool startup, all you have to do is just spin up a vehicle on AngelList. You can aggregate the demand from your friends or sometimes even from strangers, and you can earn uh, carried interest on that. They have a new phenomenon called rolling funds, which lets you take in capital on an ongoing basis. Uh, a lot of venture funds are experimenting with scout programs, which is you basically take 
prominent entrepreneurs, you give them a checkbook to write 50K checks as like almost an experiment. And when you're a big enough fund and you have a, a network of, of scouts working in your interest all around the Bay Area and all around the world, it's like a really interesting deal flow sourcing mechanism. Uh, there are venture builders. FJ Labs is a venture builder. We have an arm where we incubate marketplaces each year with some of the most amazing entrepreneurial MBAs in the US. There are different funds that are experimenting with revenue-based financing, which means that they will invest in you and you have the ability to pay them back 3x their money in a couple of years. Uh, and that's a really interesting IRR profile for an investor. So there's an explosion of innovation taking place in venture as an asset class. Venture, to, to put it in perspective, venture is still microscopic compared to other asset classes. So even though it feels like we're in this hot tech bubble at the moment, the truth is that there is so much more room to grow. Uh, the percentage of companies that still take venture funding is tiny, and it's typically limited to a couple of cities. So I'm very bullish on the asset class of venture capital uh, in the medium and, and the long term. Um, a couple of interesting other trends in the industry. A lot of VC firms, it's it's as they're raising more money and they're trying to fight and win deals, they're using data. So funds have data scientists whose job is to scrape LinkedIn profiles. When someone posts on LinkedIn or Twitter building something new, it implies that they have a new startup. So you might reach out to them, see what they're doing. They're looking at credit card panel data to see how people are spending money and they, see if they can notice any patterns there. They're looking at app store data. They're looking at web traffic. And they're trying to source these hidden gems using all these different alternative data sources. I touched on how companies are staying uh, private longer. A lot of seed funds, they only have the ability to follow on a couple of rounds. So these seed funds will raise what's called an opportunity fund, another pool of capital to continue to feed their winners as they stay private longer and longer. So imagine you invest in the seed round of Uber. Uh, you invest in the seed. You do your pro rata in the Series A and then the Series B. But now you're tapped out. But this is Uber. You're super bullish on it. They have all this appetite. What do you do for the Series C, the Series D? And this company stays private longer. It raises more and more capital. And you don't want to lose that. So you raise an opportunity fund, which is dedicated to following on in your big winners and can have incredible returns of its own. And then there's the platform function, which is a relatively new innovation. This was started by a fund called First Round Capital in New York, which is actually the first uh, investor in Uber. Uh, and what they, what they have done is they've, in order to win deals and also just to support their existing companies, they've built out a team of dozens of people. And their role is to help startups in any way they can. They've built a community of like-minded founders who can ask each other questions. They help with pitch practice. They help with recruiting. They help with fundraising. They help with management best practices. And they basically serve as this uh, advisory function. And it, it's an extreme differentiator. And now we've seen a ton of different uh, funds do this. I'd say it's almost table stakes now in venture capital to have a platform function uh, to help companies. So that's a pretty interesting new innovation. And a bunch more I can I can go on and on about, and I'd be happy to talk with people later about it. Uh, well, I think I can wrap it up with this, my predictions on what happens with venture and, and the industry going forward. It's been, uh, it's been a really interesting time due to COVID. Uh, there have been unprecedented tailwinds for tech as a whole, uh, and we're continuing to see eye-popping valuations in the public markets. We've seen this bonanza of SPACs, which are blank check vehicles, which are designed to take private companies public quickly and efficiently. Uh, there are 300 SPACs looking for late stage private company targets to go public right now, which uh, all of this together is resulting in a liquidity bonanza for VCs. So uh, IPO market is super hot. M&A market is hot. Valuations are high. It's it's really an amazing time to be a, a, a VC at the late stage and at the early stage, and this is all being this is all being uh, fueled by low interest rates all around the world, uh, and high stock prices, like high asset prices, which lar writ large, and investors chasing yield. So this is also not only a good time to be a venture manager for your existing portfolio, it's also a good time to be a venture manager looking to raise capital because you're getting exits and you have hungry LPs looking to get good returns. So just <laughs> it's a really good time to be in VC. Now, of course, all of this can change in a dime. We're all seeing macro risk in real time. 
uh, and it, it, it's a very un, like it's an uneven if even a recovery like it, it, it's it's a lot of precarious things that people should be wary about. But I'd be lying if it wasn't if I'd say it wasn't good to be a VC at this moment in time. Um, so. So, yeah, I, th I think I can wrap it at that and see if we have any questions. Um, I, it's, uh, it's, it's fun being in VC. I, re I really like it. <laughs> so, actually, so a few questions for you. If you're an entrepreneur and, you know, this is the first time you've heard, like, how VCs work, w what should your takeaway be as an entrepreneur in terms of, like, should you care about where the fund is in its life cycle? I mean, you talked about it maybe specifically, but it'd be, it'd be great to get, like, there's this distilled level of, like, what do you need to know as an entrepreneur? Yes, for sure. It's very important as an entrepreneur to understand who is on the other side of the table and what their incentives are. And I'm glad you touched on that fund cycle uh, point there, because one thing I should have talked about is that the typical venture fund, it deploys over two to three years, and then they have to go out and raise another one. So if I were an entrepreneur right now and I was raising from a venture fund, first of all, I would identify, I would identify w what my company is and where I am in the ecosystem. So I'm going to pretend I am a seed fund, okay? I would look for all of the companies that invest at seed in my geo. Uh, I would make sure to target them. I'd look at the competitive landscape, see if they're conflicted out by other investments. I would understand who the right deal partner is at each fund. I would reach out to them either through warm intro or uh, through a very compelling short uh, letter or presentation. Uh, and then I would also understand what's the size of their fund, where are they in deployment, and based on the size of the fund, like what is their strategy? Are they leading? If they're leading, what are their ticket sizes? Do they require ownership? Do they take board seats? Uh, the most important element, in my opinion, of raising a round of capital is finding that lead investor. It's very easy to find co-investors like FJ who move quickly, who, uh, who can fill out the round. But finding that lead investor who is going to take conviction, who is going to take a board seat, who's going to be your partner in this journey, uh, it's important to find them. And so I would focus on, on looking at the ecosystem of lead investors, finding the right one, understanding their incentives, their funding capabilities, uh, and then trying to win that deal. Um, a few questions coming in. Uh, do you see a venture bubble or a venture crunch coming our way? So I can't predict the future, uh, but... <laughs> there is so much dry powder in venture capital at the moment. Uh, valuations in the public markets are super high, like unbelievably high, particularly in SaaS. Uh, so I don't think there is a venture crunch coming soon. We, we saw a temporary freeze in liquidity in March and April, and it was pretty crazy. Like there was a three-week period where everyone basically stopped everything, and that's because – People didn't know if they could do deals over Zoom. People didn't know, uh, is the world ending? <laughs> so at that point, there was like a freeze, but the the accommodating policies from central banks combined with like a gradual understanding of how business is done in the new normal, uh, not only thawed out this freeze, but it also like poured fuel over the fire. So venture at, at the moment is like as hot as I ever remember it being. And like a lot of people are saying it's like as hot as basically since the, the dot-com bubble. So the, the difference now between uh, investing in internet companies uh, now versus dot-com bubble is just the number of people around the world who are connected. You're addressing a global market, which is many, many, many multiples the size of 20 years ago. And so I don't think... Well, I do think valuations are very frothy and there's tons of capital chasing a scarce number of deals. I don't think that we are in like some sort of uh, deranged, crazy bubble that is not like – like there are underlying fundamentals which make investing in venture very interesting right now and I don't think that's going to change. Do you think though that SPACs are a bubble perhaps because that seems way <laughs> frothier? So yes. So SPACs <laughs> I think are in a, definitely a bubble. Uh I think that there's going to be a near-term reckoning as uh, I believe – for recent, I have talked about this a lot, but uh, I believe there's a bunch of adverse selection taking place where a, a lot of B and C tier companies, which don't really have business being public, are getting taken public by SPACs desperate to earn the 20% promote. Uh, 
and and this might be confusing to some people. I'm happy to like later at some other time delve into the the unique economics and business of SPACs. Uh, but what I actually think is interesting is that SPACs may eat into that late stage opportunity I talked about. If companies start going public e- earlier, uh, then that that growth investing opportunity disappears. And then where do these billion dollar funds put their money? Uh, because their mandate ends when a company turns public. Some funds can still invest uh, in the public markets, but most of them, th- th- they raise the money to invest in the private markets. So if if companies start going public after Series C, Series D, what happens at the late stage? And I think that's an interesting question that we, we're going to see some interesting developments uh, on that end. Actually, I think that's a great idea for another episode. Like, what are SPACs? How do they work? Uh, yeah, we should. Yeah, I, I think great, yeah. yeah, we should do that at some point in the coming months. Uh, a few more questions. So Andrew Corley is asking, if you're uh, a fund manager, I assume he is raising a fund, or and you're ex- expecting to be oversubscribed, or, um, would you at that, at that time decide to raise the, the carry? Mm. So frankly, it's very context dependent. Uh, I don't know what fund number you're on. I don't know uh, what your LP base looks like. Uh, keep in mind that if you raise carry, you're hurting net returns. So if you get too greedy and like the goal, like the fir- like your first goal is survival. Like you want to raise this fund, but ho- you want to raise funds into perpetuity. So if you get too greedy in this fund, uh, it might make it harder to raise a fund two funds from now. So I would focus on instead building a healthy uh, investor base of people who are long-term oriented and are going to invest. Like they're basically when they're committing to you now, they're committing across four different funds, and they're co- they're they're committing to a multi-decade relationship instead of optimizing for short-term economics. Um, so I was asking. So what's the upside or downside, or what are the implications of being of being linked as an entrepreneur to a startup studio? <sighs> um. Fabrice, so I, I think you just did an episode on startup studios and like the different economics and models. Uh, there can be a reputational benefit to be linked to a startup studio. Certain funds, I mean, like I'm kind of talking my own book here, but when FJ raises a round, like we already have a group of investors who are like keen to see every incubate, uh, an FJ incubation raises around. We have investors who are like excited to see what our next incubation is like, and will want to invest because of the FJ affiliation. Now, it depends, again, on the underlying economics. Some startup studios are more aggressive than others in, in early economics, and you want to make sure your founders are properly incentivized. And so I think it really, again, I, I'm sorry I can't give like a very broad like directional answer here, but it's context dependent. But uh, if you are aligned with a strong, like a well-reputed startup studio, it will make your future fundraising easier. Uh, Gregory's wondering, how, if he wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, you can email me. I'm jeff at fjlabs.com. The, uh, Olive is wondering, or is saying, you know, it's, if you don't actually come from, uh, the top, the top business schools or the top, uh, schools that you're looking and you're, I have a venture, but, and you're looking for an angel, how do you go about finding that first pre-seed angel round? Uh, because it's not obvious. It's not obvious and it's hard and it's, and frankly, it's like, it's unfair. Uh, so much of the friends and family round just comes from having like a rich and well-connected and, uh, uh, capable network. And like some people just don't have that network. So if you are, if you are not from this like tech mafia or you didn't go to one of the elite schools, uh, it's going to be harder and that sucks, but what you can there, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. I mean, I think there's this guy on Twitter, Turner Novak, he grew up like, poor in like the mid in the Midwest suburb. And he had like no, that like no typical pedigree or credentials. And he literally just tweeted his way to a venture job. He made a name for himself on Twitter by being really insightful and like focusing on consumer social. And now he's like literally a, a thought leader who's going on international podcasts and he has a venture role. And so I would say the same thing with raising capital, like try to build a name for yourself and stand out. And like, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely doable and people are raising money on platforms like Twitter and so forth. So it's, it's a little bit hard and non-traditional, but like you just have to work, you just have to work at it and then build a name for yourself. Any examples of uh, good or great deals missed by FJ and why? 
<laughs> well, Fabrice has a whole bunch of stories. Um, <laughs> I mean, Fabrice, why don't you tell him about the, uh, well, one of the platforms we're using right now, <laughs> the streaming platform that you saw very early on. <laughs> the streaming platform. Which one did I? <laughs> Well, Twitch. <laughs> oh, Twitch. Oh, yeah. I was friends with Justin. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. I was a gamer. and it, I had a bias against media because I'm like, ah, oh, media, it's hard to monetize. It's hard to get scale despite being a gamer. And, and also, even though I was a gamer, I couldn't put myself in the shoes of someone who's going to be watching it. I also thought, you know, YouTube is going to win uh, well, should be winning in video in general. And, and it's completely ridiculous. My entire thesis is verticalization. And Twitch is a, in a way is a live version and vertical of YouTube. So I would actually I I see it coming. I could I think I, I had the opportunity to invest at a two million pre money valuation. This is a company that exited a billion, and I completely missed it. I'm like ah, YouTube's gonna win. Don't don't see the verticalization in this case. And why would anyone do that? And of course I was completely wrong. Uh, and, and by the way, it, in a way it is a marketplace. It's an intermediary, even though it's content between the creators of content, which are the streamers uh, and the gamers and the consumers of content. So whoops, <laughs> two million pre. And I was friends with the founder, you know. And I and I really really loved him too. I just didn't see it. Um, Julian is wondering, do do VCs have appetite if the TAM is ginormous for businesses that have a high, heavy fixed cost up front, even the, and especially if the margins are tight? And if not, how do you finance these types of businesses? Because you know, if you need 20, 30, 40 million to get going, how do, how do you do that? It's a good question. Uh, it depends on the VC. I'd say most VCs do not have the appetite but you will see some investments because uh, keep in mind, high fixed costs is often, that's often a moat. So like you think about like healthcare startups, sometimes you'll see, uh, or I mean, biotech, like biotech is a perfect example. So clearly biotech VCs have the appetite. They're willing to put tens, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars of work uh, into a company before they have like even like early stage trials. So uh, I think it really depends on the VC and, but to add, like to go back to your question, how can that be financed? Um, there are other forms of finance. Like, for example, I was listening to a podcast yesterday about uh, a YC partner was talking about Boom Supersonic, which is this uh, – they're trying to build, like, a new Concorde, a supersonic jet. And so in the early stage, it was invested by venture, but then they're like, GE has – uh, a deal where they will finance up to $500 million for like a new jet engine, presumably uh, because they want to actually help build it and, and uh, the contract for it. So there are other forms of alternate financing. I think you just have to look at the ecosystem you're in. Uh, Phil's asking if we've thought much about a secondary strategy. Now, it's not clear to me if he means if we're selling secondaries or buying <laughs> secondaries, uh, but the, um, oh, actually, in this case, should you buy or? or sell, um, I guess he says he knows I sold Viagogo via secondary, which I actually did. Um, yeah, how do you think about secondaries, both on the buy side and the sell side, actually? We love secondaries, I th and, and I think I should have mentioned that in our strategy. One of the reasons our strategy works so well is because we are often so small, we're typically sub 3% ownership of any given business. That gives us the freedom to be very opportunistic if we uh, want to buy more or, or sell. So we will routinely invest at seed. Uh, a company will develop a ton of momentum, grow super quickly, and then it might become too hot. And if a company is raising a Series C at what we deem to be a crazy valuation, we might sell half, lock in a 10 times return, let the rest ride, uh, and and then we've delivered an incredible IRR in return to our investors. So you can't do that if you're a Sequoia and you're on the board of the company. That can kill the company because everyone's going to look and say, okay, Sequoia owns 20% of this business. They're on the board. What do they see? Why are they selling? But when FJ Labs sells a million of secondary in a $50 million round, like people don't even blink an eye. So it's like being small is a competitive advantage. So we buy secondaries. We sell secondaries. We love secondaries. And I think Phil was asking more on the buy side. Like, um, when or how would you buy secondaries? Mm. Yeah. So I, I, we're super flexible. We sometimes buy, sometimes we will, uh, 
and, and we 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 will buy secondaries if we can't get into the primary. Sometimes a round they will like there'll be a primary round, and then in conjunction with that, they'll do a secondary to clean up the the cap table and buy out some early angels. We're happy to buy into that. Typically, we'd like to see a discount if we're buying common shares and there's a big preference stack above. So maybe we'll invest at a 15 or 20 percent discount uh, for common shares. Uh, it really depends on how big the pref stack is, and again, context dependent. Uh, other times we'll use platforms. I mean, some of our we've had some amazing investments where we've bought on secondary trading platforms like Forge, which used to be called Equidate or Equity Zen, uh, or occasionally we've even worked with brokers. So it, I think it's one of the beautiful things about our model is that that flexibility helps us drive outsized returns. Yeah, I guess if you're an angel and you're thinking through, should you be buying secondaries? The issue is. You- you need to remember, you don't have access to all that much information. So if you can find information in the sure. company uh, <laughs> independently because you know the founders, you know you know existing investors, et cetera, it'll allow you to make a better decision. But like just buying Airbnb on Forge because you think it's a good company, I mean, that's more a lottery ticket approach because it's not as though you would get any information anyway. So I, I try to do it yeah. in an informed way. The only companies you can usually, by the way, buy secondaries that are the ones that are late stage and doing really, really well. Like, obviously, I would love to sell yep. secondaries. All my you know companies are doing not very well. <laughs> no one would like to buy them anyway. So the, these secondaries are really only available for the very, very best companies. And or, or, and typically have like a big brand name. So usually consumer facing or if you're like a SaaS product, you're like a very hot, well-known one. So um, I think that'll be it for today. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for joining. This is great. And I'm sure we'll do it again uh, shortly. Yeah, thank you.